horizon I can see a life together Standing by you and I think I want to forever And after all it's come and gone through all the years I can't believe the moment's finally here And you Welcome to the launch event um, of the Center for Holistic Initiatives for Learning and Development, uh, or CHAL, and its first webinar. It's a pleasure to have you with us. I am Yong Seng. Uh, I'm the co-director of CHAL and group director of pediatrics at the NUHS. So in tandem with our launch, we've organized this webinar series as part of uh, CHAL's key outreach initiatives to engage policymakers academics and practitioners in a collaborative dialogue focused on innovations in research, policy, uh, and practice related to early childhood development. And we will use this series to explore aspects of uh, child development and discuss potential inter uh, interventions that could make a difference and give children the best start to life. And to keep updated with our work and events and the uh, subsequent webinars, you can visit our website and subscribe to our newsletters and follow our LinkedIn and Twitter pages. In today's webinar, we will start with an opening address by Professor Chong Yap Singh, followed by a keynote address by Ms. Rahayu, Parliamentary Secretary uh, for Ministry of Communications and Inve Information and Ministry of Health. And this will be followed by a presentation by Dr. Evelyn Law on the relation between the use of digital media and brain development. And finally, we have a panel discussion with our guest speakers, Professor Phil Fisher, uh, Ms. Vivian Ng, and uh, Professor Donna Cross on today's topic, Innovations in Bridging the Evidence to Policy and Practice Gap uh, in Early Childhood. And Associate Professor Robin Milden, uh, who is my fellow co-director at Child and the founding executive director uh, of the Center for Evidence and Implementation, will be the moderator for today's uh, panel discussion. And if you have any questions throughout this webinar, feel free to use the Q&A function to submit your questions and we'll try our best to answer all of them. So without further ado, let us welcome Professor Chong Yap Singh, the Lian In Chao Professor in Medicine and the Dean of the Yong Lu Lin School of Medicine in NUS to commence this webinar with the opening address. Yap Singh, please. Thank you, Yong Singh. A very good morning to Ms. Rahayu Mazam, Parliamentary Secretary, Ministry of Communications and Information, and Ministry of Health. Esteemed speakers, panelists, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the launch of the new Centre for Holistic Initiatives for Learning and Development. In the National Day Rally speech in uh, August 2017, Prime Minister Lee Hsien Loong announced that Singaporeans can expect more childcare places, more quality kindergartens, and better trained preschool teachers and that the Ministry of Education will more than triple its kindergartens by 2023. He said, free schools for children aged two months to six years are important in giving them a good start and the best chance to succeed in life. We must do this because every child counts. If we get this right, we will foster social mobility and sustain a fair and just society. Since 2019, 80 PAP community foundation kindergartens 
have also been progressively converted to full-day childcare centres to give greater assurance to working parents as well as young couples looking to start a family that their children will be looked after well after school uh, and when they are free. These centres have a robust curriculum with an emphasis on developing lifelong skills such as literacy and numeracy, nurturing creative expression and encouraging healthy social and emotional development in every child. As a nation, we applaud these positive steps to holistically develop our children into confident, well-rounded individuals. As an academic institution promoting child health and well-being, we aim to do more to identify critical developmental pathways and advocate best practices to ensure that every child has the best start to life. Early childhood is an important time where numerous factors need to be in place for a child to develop to his or her full potential. But lack of awareness among parents and caregivers often mean that some children miss out. Even worse, at-risk children fall through the gap and face societal prejudices when growing up because of a lack of contextualized research and implementation of evidence-based interventions that can help. Child is a collaborative multidisciplinary center that brings together experts in the field of translational research, child development, and implementation science to help improve the health and developmental outcomes of children. Backed by data collected by the Growing Up in Singapore Towards Healthy Outcomes or GUSTO study, and tapping on other international studies, CHILD aims to build upon and expand the best evidence available to guide practice and develop evidence-based interventions for the betterment of emotional, cognitive, and social outcomes for all children. It has been estimated that it normally takes 17 years to turn research into practice and policy. CHILD aims to close this gap by generating and carefully curating locally contextualized evidence that can be implemented quickly and be scaled up sustainably. CHILD aims to partner the existing community and government stakeholders to help implement the best practices in early childhood learning and development. The work of CHILD does not end with research. The free and proactive sharing of knowledge and best practice locally and internationally is a critical part of the mission. Ultimately, it seeks to help build up robust community care models and sustainable early intervention programs which are scalable in our local context and create value beyond our borders. I would like to take this opportunity to extend my appreciation, especially to the Lian Foundation for their generosity and support, and Parliamentary Secretary Ms. Rahayu Mazam for gracing this occasion. I must also thank the Center for Evidence and Implementation and ASTAR's Singapore Institute for Clinical Sciences for their partnership in establishing CHILD. Last but not least, I'd like to thank Professor Robin Milden and Professor Lee Yong Sing for their leadership in getting CHILD off to a good start, as well as the many scientists, clinicians, and administrators who have contributed their expertise to make this endeavor possible. Thank you for attending this launch. I wish you an enjoyable and enlightening webinar. Thank you, Prof Chong. Um, it is with great pleasure and it's an honor for us to have Ms. Rahayu Mazam the Parliamentary Secretary for Ministry of Communications and Information and Ministry of Health to give the keynote address. Ms. Rahayu has championed the interests of um, the special needs community and the youth development in Parliament. She has introduced many social programs in the Bukit Batok East to help families, support students and uplift women. Ms. Rahayu, thank you for gracing this occasion and you may begin your address. Thank you very much, Prof Lee. Mr. Xie Fu Hua, Chairman, NUS Board of Trustees, NUS and NUHS, Prof. Yeo K. Guan, Chief Executive, NUS, NUHS, Mr. Lawrence Lian, Chairman, Lian Foundation, Mr. Li Po Wa, CEO, Lian Foundation, Mr. Peter Hodgson, Chair, Center for Evidence and Implementation, Professor Johan Eriksson, Deputy Executive Director, Singapore Institute for Clinical Sciences, esteemed speakers and panelists, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I'm delighted to join you this morning at the inaugural Evidence to Policy and Practice webinar series in conjunction with the launch of the Centre for Holistic Initiatives for Learning and Development, or in short, CHILD. It is my honour to be in the presence of many established academics and practitioners in the area of early childhood development. 
As a mother with a young child, today's topic is close to my heart. As parents, our greatest concern is how we can help our children grow up well and achieve their aspirations. We believe that every child deserves the best start in life and should be given the opportunity to develop well throughout his life so as to reach his full potential. To enable this, we need to extend more support to the family, especially the mother, because her health and well-being exert a significant influence on her child's development even before her child is born. We also cannot undermine the influence of the family and parenting practices on the trajectory of a child's development. To this end, we have set up an interagency task force earlier this year to develop a national child and maternal health and well-being strategy that will focus on supporting women and their children to attain good health and well-being, leading to a healthier next generation. This will be a five-year strategy, adopting a life course approach, starting as early as preconception to adolescents aged 18 years old. As the needs of a child and his family extend beyond healthcare, we have brought together various agencies, including those from the education and social domains, to jointly address cross-cutting issues that will require close collaboration across agencies. We recognize there could be many aspects of child and maternal health and well-being that we could focus on. We're therefore prioritizing key areas with clear, measurable health and social, health, social and education outcomes for our young that would benefit multiple generations. Let me elaborate. I would broadly group the task force's efforts into three key thrusts. First, we are focusing on translating evidence-based findings into policies and programs to address risk factors and going further upstream on preventive health efforts for women and children. This is where platforms like today's could be leveraged to support the efforts. A few months ago, we had a very fruitful discussion learning from Prof Chong and his team on the Gusto findings. We explored how some of these evidence-based findings could be translated into programs to address the specific needs of the child at different life stages and developmental milestones. One of the topics we discussed was on-screen time for young children and how early screen and TV viewing could impact the cognitive development of a child. This is also the focus of today's webinar series and I look forward to further discussions later. Second, we are reviewing our service delivery for children and their families. We want to better integrate our services across the domains to deliver holistic and seamless care to children and their families. By wrapping services around the mother-child diet, we hope to make it easier for families to access services. This would also help us to provide better support for mothers who may otherwise neglect their own healthcare needs. In the last few months, I had the privilege of joining colleagues from the health, social and education domains in several conversations with our frontline officers to understand their key challenges in service delivery and to jointly identify opportunities where we could further strengthen collaboration across the health, social, education domains. There have been insightful sessions where issues and suggestions raised helps us to crystallize our thinking further as we work towards extending more integrated and holistic support to the mother and child. Third, we are reviewing our approaches to engage stakeholders and the public and to hear what matters most to them. A big part of this effort that I am leading involves public education to raise awareness and communicate our key messages to parents, grandparents, educators, caregivers, and the general public to shape positive behaviors. We will continue to engage these stakeholders to understand their concerns, common pain points, and aspirations in order to ensure that our messages and support to them are relevant. To achieve the desired health outcomes at the individual and population level, it is important for the recommendations of the task force and the strategy to be grounded on sound scientific basis. While we have identified research as one of the key enablers for the child and maternal health and well-being strategy, I would like to highlight that the translation of these scientific research and evidence-based findings into policies and program interventions would be the key to making a real difference to individuals. 
I'm heartened to know that Childhood Focus on doing this and its launch today signifies the start of more conversations to consider how research could better inform policies and programs to benefit more children and their families. Let me offer three suggestions that I think research could help to sharpen our efforts. Firstly, we need a good basis for policymaking and program intervention. Evidence-based findings from robust research and analysis could better inform our policies and help refine our recommendations and interventions to make them relevant and effective. For example, through distilling evidence-based findings, we could design better screening tools to accurately and reliably de detect and identify at-risk children so that uh, targeted interventions or relevant services could be provided to meet their needs holistically. Secondly, we need to be we need to better communicate scientific research findings into clear, salient messages easily understood by key stakeholders, like parents and educators who are non-researchers. For example, parents need to understand the key implications of screen time on their child's cognitive development and the evidence-based guidance that they could take reference from. We need to make sure that such messages and guidance which originate from rigorous research are simple and comprehensible. Thirdly, it is important to keep our translation of research and knowledge current. We need to communicate such messages faster to key stakeholders to address any information lag. This would enable interventions to start as early as possible to benefit children and their families. Take screen time for us. As an example, like myself, some of us sitting here could be parents of young children and we may have some questions about the negative impact of screen time on young children. The Gusto study had found that exposure to passive viewing screen time below the age of 18 months is associated with poor cognitive and language outcomes. The duration of infant television viewing at one year of age was also negatively associated with subsequent cognitive and language skills at four and a half years of age. This remains significant even after accounting for perinatal, child and family circumstances. In addition, screen time between one and one and a half years old has been associated with a variety of social skills deficits commonly found in children on the autism spectrum. Such a vital piece of evidence would certainly influence and guide how we provide care for our children. The setting up of child is a timely and significant boost to enable the process of translating evidence-based findings into policies and programs in early childhood development, with its intent to engage and bring together key local stakeholders from both the public and private sector who are interested in the emotional, cognitive and social well-being of children from conception to primary school years. We welcome the further conversations that child could generate and contribute towards a healthier next generation. In closing, I would like to congratulate NUS Young, Lu, Young Lulin School of Medicine, Professor Chong Yap Singh and the team at Child on its launch. Thank you and have a fruitful webinar. Thank you, Ms. Rahayu. Uh, your address is really insightful. Uh, we can take reference to the many points that we have raised. And Child will strive to fulfill its mission and contribute to the country's effort to translate evidence to, to policy. Thank you. And the increasing use of digital media by our young children is a, a cause for concern. That there is scientific evidence of the negative impact of screen viewing uh, in early childhood. And our next speaker is Dr. Evelyn Law. She is a practicing child development pediatrician at NUH. And amongst her other roles, uh, she's a PI for the translation Translational Neuroscience Program at ASTAR's Singapore Institute for Clinical Sciences. And she will share with us today the key insights uh, on digital media use on brain development. Uh, a gentle reminder again to everyone to use the Q&A function to submit your question at any time during the presentation. Evelyn, over to you. Thank you. Um, for the very kind introduction, Professor Lee, and thank you to Parliamentary Secretary Ms. Raihayu for talking about screen time. So in the next eight minutes, I will use this topic, which is only one of many topics within child, to give you a glimpse into how research can be contextualized to a local setting and to illustrate the roles of child in bridging evidence gaps. 
Taking data from the Gasto cohort, you can clearly see that the majority of young children under age two have used digital media in Singapore, with one in 20 children doing their work week of 40 hours or more in front of screens. The big disconnect, though, is that guidelines around the world either recommend no or limited screens for children under age two. This is when it is important to understand the effect of digital media on our young children and within our local context. So you're probably wondering if I will tackle the question of to watch or not to watch today. Let me preface by saying that digital media is a topic whereby you can spin it positive or negative, and at the same time, make yourself sound credible. The reality is that researchers know less than what people claim. What we know is that evidence is actually not all good, or bad news, and it depends on multiple factors, including many that are listed here. In the interest of time, I've highlighted two factors, which are in orange to talk about today. My goal is to use digital media as a topic to show you how innovative science can start to bridge evidence to policy. So in terms of children ages zero to one and a half years, we know that they learn poorly from 2D screens and have difficulty transferring information to real life. So just to briefly illustrate this, take a look at these nine month old girls. You can see the baby on the left is looking at pictures with the actual spelling words on the screen, which seems educational, but it is almost as if the girl is just more fascinated by the bright lights and she's using the iPad as a tactile toy. So you can see her throwing the iPad down um, once in a while. And to contrast that, the other baby is practicing her motor skills by clapping her hands or tapping her thigh while looking at her caregiver. She's exploring the sensory toys in the environment. And uh, in a little bit, you could see that she's actually really showing her enjoyment and smiling back at the caregiver. Um, so you can see that uh, coming up here. There you go. So before I show you our data, I want to first introduce a neuroscience tool called EEG in our lab. There are many advantages to EEG because infants don't respond the same way as adults or older children in the lab. So look at this video here. You cannot just ask the baby to touch the eye of the mo moving fish or give other instructions to study behaviors. So in the same way, if we subject a baby to two scenarios, one, which you're seeing now is a baby pretending to be on the, uh, a mother pretending to be on the phone and in a few seconds, another scenario where the mother shows a face with no emotions, this baby looks upset in both scenarios. But what if I tell you that we can tease out how the brain waves are different between the two scenarios? So this innovative technique works by putting an EEG net, which is like a hat that is full of sensors. Actually, it's 128 brain sensors, to be precise, that you just put on like a hat. Each sensor detects brainwave signals and can tell us multifaceted information about a baby's reaction to a variety of experiences. So now, this is one kind of data we get from our EEG studies. Here you can see pictures of the brain. What it's showing is that the more infants um, younger than 18 months are exposed to digital media, the more changes are observed in the brain. And this is indicated by the amount of redness, which is often seen in children with attention deficits. Usually, attention deficit symptoms are hard to discern until maybe ages seven or above. But in our Singapore labs, we can detect these changes way earlier during infancy. These kinds of brainwave studies can also, in the future, detect recovery and, or worsening um, later on. So what about toddler years? 
So for toddler years, the Gusto children are actually now finishing primary school. But while they were one and a half to three years of age, we collected the digital media use. For those who were exposed to screens for more than one hour per day at that point, we saw changes in multiple domains of their development. Um, which included IQ, language, social, emotional well-being, attention, and self-regulation skills. These findings are consistent with other studies around the world, but we're able to confirm that this is true in Singapore. This slide is not meant to scare or shame any parents. Instead, we know that there are ways for parents to be intentional about using screens and to use them in beneficial ways without displacing important activities like playtime or much needed interactions with caregivers. I'm sure the panel will comment on this further. So to conclude, our local research demonstrate that digital media is not recommended for children ages one and a half and younger. Firstly, children at this young age learn poorly from 2D screens. Secondly, brainwave studies suggest that digital media changes how the brain operates. Additionally, the brains of toddlers continue to be sensitive to digital media use of greater than one hour per day, particularly in the areas of social emotional behaviors and attention self-regulation skills, which are important for their future achievements. And it is important to recognize that digital media is only one of many factors within the home context. More focus should be placed on actually using digital media with intention and fostering cognitively stimulating activities with young children. Thank you. Terrific, Evelyn. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. I'm Robin Milden. I'm um, the executive director for the Center for Evidence and Implementation and the co-director of our new center, Child. Evelyn, we have a couple of questions coming in that I thought I'd field to you, if that's okay. Sure, of uh, course. I'll read one. I'm curious about the Gusto study on screen time. What alternatives do you suggest for parents apart from screen time if they do not have the money or ability to engage their children otherwise? Thank you for that question. Um, so play is certainly something easy. Um, some parents think, think of play as using so many resources, buying toys from various stores, but actually play is really just about talking to your child. You can take anything in your home, pots and pans, chopsticks, um, anything that's safe, um, and um, really interact with your child. And that is probably the best um, brain building um, element that you have within your home that doesn't even need a device. Um, it's safe. Um, and actually, children enjoy that probably more than having a screen in front of them. Yep. Terrific. I've got time for one more again from yeah. the audience. Please keep yes. your questions coming in. Good morning, Dr. Law. What if the child is exposed to a primary caregiver who is a heavy user of digital media, but not directly exposed to digital devices themselves? Does this, will this affect their development? Very good question. It actually leads me mm -hmm. to that middle video that you saw earlier um, uh, where uh, um, the caregiver was looking down. It was actually just a plastic phone, but you could see the child was looking at the ceiling, was upset and really needing that type of nurturing interaction. So again, I don't know the situation of this family. I do feel for a lot of families, especially single parent families. Um, so I'm not making a comment on that family. There's a lot of things happening in the home context. However, if it is at all possible, um, I think it would be actually reasonable to think of even 10 minutes of very cognitive stimulation, a uh, stimulating type of activity with this child, even before this particular adult pick up a phone, um, pick up a phone or a device. Um, 
So I think certainly um, um, understanding um, that or having that awareness that even an adult using the screen um, can eventually or indirectly affect a child's um, well-being and development, that's probably an important um, thing for the public to understand. Yes, absolutely. Well, thank you very much. Those messages are nice and clear and um, complimented the previous speakers. So thank you, Evelyn. I think we'll have thank the um, panel join us. Thank you. Now we are moving into our panel session um, where I have the pleasure of introducing three very, very dynamic, important and um, high impact members of the early childhood public. So I'll introduce each of you briefly, but I, as, as you go into the panel and you, have, you do your own introduction, feel free to add parts of your bio that I um, have dropped off. So firstly, Professor Donna Cross. Donna is a behavioral scientist and professor at the University of Western Australia and program head of education and development at the Telethon Kids Institute. Um, Donna has been awarded multi-million dollar grants, has made an enormous impact on early childhood, both here in Australia and in um, places all over the world, in particular, the translation of good science into policy practice. And she's got some terrific examples that she's going to share with us. Next, Professor Phil Fisher. Uh, Phil is the um, H. Knight Chair and Professor of Psychology at the University of Oregon, where he serves as the founding director of the Center of Translational Neuroscience. He's a senior fellow also at the Center on the Developing Child and a member of the National Scientific Council on Developing Child, both based at Harvard University. I could keep going also reading Phil's uh, bio. I won't. I'll let him speak for himself. But Phil and I um, have had some very robust conversations around the translation of evidence and services. So I'm very much looking forward to hearing what he has to say. And then Ms. Vivian Nguyen, who is the Chief Psychologist at the Ministry of Social and Family Development and Director of the Office of the Chief Psychologist. Vivian is just a terrific person in terms of her dedicated focus on the use of evidence and policy and practice in Singapore. I have known her for quite a while. Uh, we have also had some terrific, robust conversations, and I would credit Vivian for being one of the leaders in Singapore for really trying to bridge this use of evidence and policy practice. So I've probably embarrassed her enough um, and uh, we'll move on. So Donna, if I could invite you to, to open this panel and give us some sort of early thoughts, even connecting your ideas with the previous speakers. So please go ahead. Thanks very much, Robin. And uh, thank you everyone for the opportunity to, uh, to talk with you today. Um, before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that I'm meeting on, which is the uh, Noongar Wajak people, and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. I have uh, had a very privileged uh, uh, opportunity in Western Australia, obviously, to do and, and lead uh, a lot of research. But in particular, uh, in the last three years, I've been working alongside an extraordinary philanthropic group called the Mindaroo Foundation, who have uh, funded uh, some um, amazing opportunities for us to translate evidence into practice. We have much evidence in Australia and around the world that guides policy and practice. The challenge, I think, for all of us is how do we get it into the hands of people who need it most? And particularly, uh, how do we strengthen those uh, members of the community, families, practitioners, policymakers, so that they can continue to drive the agenda for us? So the Minjuru Foundation gave us this tremendous opportunity to do what we call fall forward. And that means to be able to take risks around the ways that we've been able to translate uh, this science. And I'd like to share very quickly uh, four big ideas that, uh, that we were able to take forward as a result of, uh, of the Minjuru Foundation. These four ideas, the first one, how do we lift the tide of awareness across the community about the importance of early childhood? First big idea. Second big idea, how do we get that evidence into the hands of parents? So let's lift the whole community and then specifically, how do we get to parents? 
How do we get evidence to local communities? What things can we be doing to provide evidence in ways that local communities can make decisions using their own evidence and other evidence? And the fourth big idea is how do we help get economic evidence to government? Because we know Treasury makes the decision about where money is spent. So what kinds of processes could we use? So in a super quick snapshot, I'd like to tell you what we built for each of those four big ideas. The first idea, let's lift the tide of awareness across the community. We built something called the core story in association with an extraordinary group that I know Phil perhaps will mention this morning as well, the Frameworks Institute who are based in Washington. They led three years of research with us in Australia to look at how we can fine tune our messaging to make sure that our messages are salient and land and motivate the community to see the value in children. We have many reports that come out of that work and we're very happy to share those with you. But the core story is effectively many voices singing one song. So mobilising all the major communicators in early childhood across Australia with similar messages. So not changing what people are doing, but aligning our messages so that we uh, have common themes. And we call that the core story. The second big idea is how do we get evidence into the hands of parents and how do we motivate them and nudge them to think about perhaps their technology use as, uh, as Evelyn so well presented a moment ago. And we developed an app. It's called Bright Tomorrows. And, uh, and that app is highly tailored. So as a parent engages with the app, the app learns what parents are interested in and prompts and nudges parents with what we call moments little things that they can do throughout their day that form part of their regular daily pattern. So they might be cooking dinner. It reminds them to narrate what they're doing, reminds them to sing often because that helps children understand how to enunciate words, gives them tips about what to do when their children are having tantrums. And Evelyn, we even give tips on how to reduce uh, or work with uh, technology so that parents can use it better. I know I only have five minutes, so very quickly, the last uh, two uh, ideas. Uh, by the way, that app is called Bright Tomorrows, and we launched just recently again, thanks to the Minduru Foundation, the uh, tiny TED Talk, which some of you uh, might have seen. We've had uh, me and downloads in the last five days of beautiful Molly uh, talking about the importance of brain science. And that was our cue to action to drive in particular parents in Australia to the Bright Tomorrows app, where we're currently testing that's usefulness. The third big idea, how do we get uh, evidence to local communities? We've developed um, something that we call the Child Development Atlas. And this uses linked data, government linked data that we've been linking fortunately in Western Australia for nearly 10 years all government data together and using GIS technology to allow local communities to quarantine by census area their communities' data that is specific to the families that are, that are in their environment. So not only linked data, but linked data with GIS. And we call that the Child Development Atlas. And that means that local communities in real time can have access to what's going on in their wider community to make decisions about what might be the best actions that can be taken. Obviously, this informs policymakers as well. And lastly, the fourth big idea, um, which is really about return on investment in early childhood, was to talk about the cost of late intervention talk to government about what the downstream costs are um, using real uh, real time Australian data so that uh, so that government can uh, see that the 50 billion dollars that it will be uh, having to find as a result of, uh, of not intervening early, not delivering what needs to be delivered in those critical early years, what that will cost the government in the long term. And again, I have much on that uh, that I'd love to talk to you later. Thank you very much, Robin. No, oh, terrific. Uh, I have much I want to ask, but I will um, invite Philip to go next, please, and then and then we will follow up with Vivian. And just for the panel, we are working on having us all on the screen at the same time, just um, so we can uh, bump off each other a little. But Phil, please. Well, thank you, Robin. Uh, thank you for the invitation to speak at this event, and it's a pleasure to uh, follow you, Donna. It's we have uh, many overlapping paths in recent years and, and as well, uh, Evelyn, to hear your talk, which was uh, exciting and, and very impressive in terms of the work that's being done. Uh, I'm gonna speak specifically about how 
the evidence base for early childhood interventions has evolved over time. And where it puts us right now as a field interested in promoting early childhood development uh, in contexts around the globe. The, uh, I, I really wanna present this as sort of a glass half full, glass half empty kind of a scenario in the sense that uh, the recent decades of research have really revealed a tremendous amount of knowledge that's incredibly important. Some has, has come from uh, studies of families followed through time uh, to understand how various early experiences affect development over the long term. Some has come, as we saw from Evelyn's talk, from the evolution of modern neuroscience, which really can take, take a look inside uh, and really understand what's going on at a biological and brain level in the course of development. Uh, that knowledge has led to an understanding that I think has been fairly effectively communicated about why the early years are so important and why they set the stage for everything that follows. And uh, I, I actually wanna just briefly mention, because I think it's related to Evelyn's talk about screen time that, you know, I think that, you, that what she said was absolutely right, that it can be sort of described in a positive or a negative way. And I also think that one of the things that when this comes up in conversations that I have a lot, uh, we know that it's here to stay, that it will be around, that it's not going to go away. And so I think part of the question is how do we understand it and leverage that for good? And so uh, for example, one of the main findings that Donna alluded to in terms of this core story is the extent to which serve and return interactions, back and forth interactions between parents and children are so critical, especially ones that begin with the child and where the parent follows the child and responds. And a lot of the conversations I've been having uh, in various contexts during the pandemic have been informed by people saying, at least in the US, we can't avoid screen time with children. Uh, parents mm -hmm. are trying to work and manage their children's education and children's care at the same time. But it is possible to have screen time that is more of a serve and return kind of screen time where there is engagement back and forth, even if both individuals are somewhat engaged with the screen. And I think it's important that we think about how to apply the knowledge to the context in which things are occurring. The pandemic has created these kinds of circumstances in ways that are very illustrative of that. So I think the glass is half full in one way because we have really a tremendous amount of information that people are now using and that has been effectively translated into policy. It's also, uh, science has led to a number of effective evidence-based evidence strategies that have been widely implemented. And I think the fact that programs can show that they do make a difference in early development is tremendously important. So why is the glass half empty? The glass is half empty because in many ways, the scientific knowledge base that began to evolve around what kinds of things work the most uh, sort of ran into some, some processes that slowed it down over the course of time. And what we've seen in the US and then subsequently in many other places is that a number of programs were developed early on, say in the 70s and 80s and 90s, uh, that were understood to make a difference. And that the focus then became almost solely on implementing those programs at scale. Was that a mistake? No, it was not a mistake. It was tremendously important to begin to roll out programs that showed that they could work. But I think these experiments, if nothing else, have yielded the knowledge that we need to continue to evolve the evidence base and that it's not so much what one program with a specific name or another one that, uh, that has a different name really do that make a, a difference and that we should be choosing among programs. It's really about the common core active ingredients that we know make the biggest difference and the extent to which those pieces of the puzzle can be put in play in community settings and delivered along the lines of what families really want and need. One of the things that we've heard, and I am one of those who's guilty of developing and disseminating a number of these programs that came from the US, were implemented here and then spread elsewhere, is that the community says these are okay, but families don't always like them. They don't always wanna participate in them, or they can't because they require 
the family inviting somebody into their home on a weekly basis when the family schedule doesn't permit. And so what we really are facing right now is a, a wonderful moment and a great opportunity that I think has only been um, accelerated by the pandemic where we really need to think about what is the next stage that scientific evidence can play in really promoting effective strategies in community-based settings. And in order to really do that, we need to both take the scientific knowledge base about what those active ingredients are, and we need to listen to communities. We need to understand what people are saying about what works for them, when they can meet, how they can meet, uh, Donna was talking about apps. Apps are tremendously powerful. Texting is something that the younger generation of parents is very familiar with and may work better than coming into an office to speak to a, a trained practitioner. So we need to take all of these different pieces and really be thinking differently about how they fit together as we move forward. And I want to uh, sort of illustrate this point uh, by an example that has been used uh, at times at the Center on the Developing Child at Harvard, but that I also learned more about as I began to share it in talks like this. So there is an example from pediatric medicine that there's a form of pediatric leukemia that 50 years ago had about a 2% survival rate. So if you got this, if your child got this and was unfortunate enough to have it, there was only a 2% chance that the child would survive. Currently, there's a 98% chance of survival. What's changed over that time? Well, one thing that changed was that the field of pediatric oncology was really found it unacceptable, understandably so, to have small scale changes. So if you go from a 2% survival rate to a 10% survival rate, that would make big news in the child development area, but it still means that 90% of children are dying. That's just really unacceptable. And so the field continued to push for innovations that would make the biggest difference. But here's the other piece that I learned. It was actually when I was doing this talk in New Zealand and an oncologist came up to me and said, you know, the interesting thing is that the difference in those 50 years isn't that there's been a tremendous explosion of new medicines to treat this illness. There are actually about five major medicines that are used and the difference, and those have been around for most of this time, the difference is how much smarter uh, pediatricians have be become in understanding what children need, when they need it, and in what sequence. And that when things aren't working, that they will then try a different protocol. And I think we should really take that as inspiration for how we think about the field of early childhood moving forward. Uh, it's, it's tremendously exciting to see what's happening in Singapore with this center launching, because I think you're at a point where you actually can capitalize on all of the knowledge that's come before, but also have a fresh start to really think about within the country of Singapore, how to support early childhood from all different perspectives in a way that makes sense. And again, I think the question is how you put the effective pieces together more than it's in any one program or in inventing a bunch of new programs. It's really the knowledge is there and it's a question of nimbly and with co-creation from the community putting it together. So I'll turn things terrific. back over. Just terrific. I mean, you could have just explained the mission and focus of child in Singapore just through what you talked about there, Phil. The, um, you know, the term that you used around active ingredients, also called common elements, which some of you in Singapore that we work with would have heard us discuss that. That we think is the new frontier in intervention design, and that's exactly what Child will try and um, take the lead on and figure out how to use that innovation and evidence in a um, in a really effective way for children and families. So it just you couldn't have. There's, there's so much, and I love that analogy. You, it's just so powerful, really. So Vivian, let's hear from you next, and um, feel free to comment um, on everything you've heard to date, and then also reflect what what this means for Singapore, given your your leadership in the system there. Thanks, Robin. That will take more than eight minutes. Uh, <laughs> I'll try to keep it within eight minutes. Um, thank you, everybody. Uh, I'm a clinical psychologist by training, and the office of the chief psychologist of OCP is a really tiny office with just four permanent headcount, uh, four professionals, and we don't do direct clinical work, but we provide clinical and educational site consultation and conduct program evaluation and research for all the MSF uh, divisions, uh, namely 
um, ACTA, for those who are overseas and those um, maybe the doctors here, it stands uh, for the Early Childhood Development Agency, for Disability Office and for the Family Development Group, uh, with the exception of rehab protection. But I did once do re uh, clinical work in rehab protection for about 13 years. And as a foster mom myself, I was just telling Phil yesterday, messaging him to say that his work on the multidimensional treatment foster care really had me interested because we've been looking at stuff like that for some time time and um, and also I mean not just the efficacy but he um, sort of looked at his transitional work included the effects on the HPA axis um, and in terms of like Donna's work in my current work in EI early intervention and with the findings of the gusto study on executive functioning as a predictor of school readiness and academic performance I'm really fascinated by her I mean I'm looking at her work on implementing uh, evidence-based programs on implementing or even just strategies on imp improving executive functioning in, in childcare or, or preschools. Um, what we've been doing um, in MSF um, over the last five to 10 years is selecting evidence-based practices and programs and using implementation science to implement it. Yes, we are aware of common elements, but I don't think we have enough evidence base yet to sort of say which common elements we should implement. So I'm really interested in seeing what comes out of the GASTO study as well as what Phil had mentioned about um, the active ingredients. Um, this is something we are very aware of. I and mean, we do try and follow the active ingredients in evidence-based programs, even if we just adapt it for our use. So um, yeah, um, I'm willing, I'd love to hear more about that. Um, what we've also been doing is collecting, uh, um, conducting a lot of um, outcome monitoring and process evaluation, for example, um, adherence to the program standards, ensuring the active ingredients are carried out with fidelity, and of course, formal program eval outcome eval as well. We've also um, had a hand in setting up numerous data collection systems for use in programming and policy. And I know people hate the data collection part and I, I empathize with everybody who's had to like give the, the results. Um, but I mean, aside from um, admin data, we use data from other assessments like self-report scales, teacher social worker ratings, observations, and one-on-one -on -one testing when needed. I think I just like to explain a little bit about um, how it's, maybe different from medical, biomedical sciences. For us, we really need to identify, develop, operationalize, quantify, and measure many different constructs, psychological, behavioral, cognitive, social, family constructs. So uh, it's not exactly your heart data, like with scan results, or imaging, or blood tests. Um, it's, I guess it's more... Uh, likened to health behavior in health uh, in the in the public health sort of setting, and we can't always wait for distal outcome measures like MOE, PSLE scores, uh, even not that we can get our hands on it, uh, or even recidivism. Uh, although we do track recidivism in our youth offending population, um, but we kind of need immediate and midterm outcomes as well to tweak programs and policies. So we have to work very much with um, policy divisions to kind of operationalize, actually even first determine what outcomes they're looking for, because that always changes, and then operationalize it and find a, a battery or tool that can um, provide measurements as close to that construct as possible. And we have to get buy-in from stakeholders and providers to help collect it and, and implement, um, whether it's assessment or programming. So it's quite difficult. and. Um, I would love to hear how you guys overcome those challenges. Um, we also try and measure, uh, I mean, we're trying to, basically what we're trying to do is to measure constructs um, in different populations, same constructs in different populations or different through different providers and centers taking the same type of clients across different programs. And we try to introduce and install either psychometrically sound tools to aid in assessments or at least minimally standardized collation of the outputs of assessment to inform practice, policy, and programming. So we've put in some common assessment frameworks, and some of you will know like the FAST tool, the Family Adult Support Tool for FSCs, and the CANS, the Child and Adolescent Needs and Strengths Tool for out-of-home care. So we can actually sort of track the percentage of families who have at least a member in the FSCs that is um, who've got developmental needs, uh, child care, stress, uh, caregiver stress, behavioral functioning issues, um, 
mental health issues so we can actually track them in a systematic and standardized way um, and we can all speak the common language which is what we are trying to achieve as well and um, we've also tried to standardize measures in parenting marriage and divorce across different programs and adult disability uh, where we can't find a tool to meet our needs we um, develop our own local tools such as the client assessment form for adults with disability, um, persons with disability. And we use them in our, day activity, uh, our disability activity centers and in our adult disability homes. It has been validated and normed and we use it for tiered funding as well. So we, we develop and, and um, look at the psychometric properties because we want this tool to be defensible to the public as we are administering public funds. Um, so we just, uh, we need it to, um, uh, satisfy um, both the funders as well as the public. Um, uh, as you, as a lot of you may know, those of you in the um, childcare sector and the early intervention sector, we are working on a standardized framework for the entire continuum of our early intervention services, both within the childcare centers, uh, for example, um, looking at the developmental support and learning support programs and the early intervention services. Uh, like and the center-based services like uh, EPIC, which stands for Early Intervention Program for Infants and Children. And one of the tools in our framework is the ECHO system, E-C-H-O, the Early Childhood Holistic Outcomes uh, System. I think Hong Hui is here today. Uh, we have adapted this from the uh, U.S. ECHO system, Early Childhood Outcomes uh, Framework, which, uh, is the fed which involves the federal reporting of early childhood outcomes um, by states. It looks at functionality rather than domain-based skills. It upskills provider in their team-based assessment of child on three GCOs or global child outcomes, which is um, the ability to develop um, social emotional relationships, to acquire and use um, knowledge and to um, meet the needs uh, using appropriate behavior. And I, I think we might have with us here KKH and um, for those uh, overseas, uh, um, participants, it stands for um, KK Women's and Children's Hospitals and the Community Psych Hub. Um, both of them form our um, technical assistance team. Um, uh, for those of you who don't know, the Community Psych Hub is not under government, but it's funded by us and reports professionally to uh, my office um, and does most of our operational work because it's just only four of us inside. So I'm going to stop here. Um, I think if there's more time, I can share more about the different uses of our data in policy and practice and in what we look for in uh, selecting um, an assessment tool. But I really hope to give more of the floor to our panelists to share and, and so that we can really pick their brains um, given their, their long expertise. So thank you. Thank you, Vivian. You're not going away yet. Um, but you, as I invited Vivian before, she is welcome to also ask questions of the others if, if uh, she felt like doing a, a um, tag team with me. But um, I have, I'm have. i going to start fielding some questions to get a, uh, try and get a, a discussion going with, with all of us here. And I would encourage people to continue to put your questions up on the Q&A. Some of our um, colleagues with the child team are answering you directly, I can see. And if not, we leave the question there for me and I will, um, I will pose it to the panel. Um, so we've talked, um, I've heard from all of you and there's been a you know, terrific conversation around what we would classify as the what at child, so active ingredients, interventions. There's also been a, um, a lot of um, important conversation around the use of data. But if we think about the mission of child and we think about where this area of implementation science came from, and of course, all three panelists know my background, so they will know where I will be going with this question. But we are here to accelerate the implementation of good science and evidence in policy and practice and for policy and practice and research to learn from each other. Because it's not a one way you know, from research, it, it needs some back and forth, some co-production, as Phil said. But essentially, the field of implementation science emerged from health out of a concern for how long it was taking for us to get things that can really help people now into business as usual. And I'd like to hear from each of you a little bit about your experience or the challenges, because despite this emerging area of science and despite all of our collective experience in working in policy and practice, we are still having a challenge 
in terms of getting that good, effective and sustainable implementation. And there might be a number of reasons or thoughts that you each have about that. If Donna, if I could start with you. Uh, obviously, there's lots of answers to that question, Robin. And uh, I'd like to start with the focus on how well uh, we as researchers are communicating to those that we hope will pick up our research. And I think that uh, perhaps there's uh, a lot lost in translation that uh, we use different language, we have uh, perhaps different expectations. I know one of the most helpful um, members of or number of members on our team are, um, are policymakers who we have asked to join our research team to train us uh, to be able to talk uh, appropriately, to frame, to understand the strategic direction of government. So I think the first issue I'd like to raise is our ability to communicate so that we can be understood uh, and, uh, and that the evidence that we have is presented in meaningful ways. And at times that might be uh, uh, using lay language uh, to, uh, to be able to achieve that outcome. And I think we all need training as, uh, as scientists to make sure that we are, are doing that. And the core story that I mentioned earlier on and the work of the Frameworks Institute, you know, having uh, opportunities to listen to the community and uh, understand how the community needs to receive and understand this information, particularly the harder to reach members of our community. We know there are lots of early adopters and people who might take up some of the research that we have, but they're not the ones that we really need to be focused on. I pick up on Phil's comment earlier about, you know, what's working for whom and in what context um, so that we can understand for whom it isn't working and why and spend time uh, deeply understanding that. So language first. The other, there are many, but perhaps the other barrier that I'd love to talk to very briefly, which relates to some work we're doing with a tool called OASIS. And this is an online implementation, a digital implementation tool that uh, helps schools. So in this instance, uh, evidence that we have for schools, early, um, very young children in schools and across the lifespan to, uh, to use the data that they have in ways that will then link them to understanding what's working and not working in their own school environment. And then using common elements, so as you've uh, referred to Robin as one of the approaches to identify active ingredients to help schools identify their data, then understand where they can go with that and to choose those things that are most relevant for the strengths and needs of their children, the students, and then um, all sorts of uh, implementation supports to help them roll out, build readiness in their school environment, obviously get the right training capacity building so that the community is open and willing, and then of course supporting that implementation over time. I, I was hoping you were going to bring that up, Donna. I'm lucky enough that Donna invited me on a grant uh, that we're hoping to get going in Australia for the use of that tool. It's a, it will be a terrific innovation. Implementing evidence in schools is one of the hardest things to do just with the way that system works. So hopefully, um, Phil, let us hear a little bit from you about your thoughts around challenges or things that have worked with implementation. I want to make two points and one builds directly on what Donna was just saying. As a, as a, person who's committed to using scientific evidence to develop strategies to help support early childhood. Uh, I, I am particularly interested, and I would say I've almost grown a little obsessed with this in recent years, with understanding the for whom programs are not working as effectively. Uh, I think that there are a lot of uh, effective strategies that will work for a certain, certain portion of any context in which a program is being implemented. And that's great. And again, that's the glass half full. But I'm fascinated by the, why are certain individuals, children, teachers, families, why are they not responding? Why, why is this not working? And that's where I want to focus my attention. And one of the things that evolved out of that sort of shift in focus is that we had for years been developing programs that were designed on a, the basis of the idea that parents did not have the skills they needed and that adults, teachers and others didn't have the skills they needed to promote healthy development in their, in their children. And that what our programs needed to do was to fill in the gaps that were missing. We learned, and this is something that's been done in many places around the world, of a, a strategy of video coaching that was originally developed in the Netherlands 
uh, in which essentially what's done is to film in the natural environment interactions between children and adults in their lives, parents or teachers or others, and to extract the positive interactions, the serve and return that's already occurring. And we have been using that extensively in the context of groups that traditionally programs haven't worked for because the people in the programs don't want to hear what they're doing wrong or what they don't know because they've had so many negative experiences already. And this is, it's, again, it's not say, to say we should throw out these other programs, but this has become an incredibly powerful tool for us in reaching people for whom telling them what they should be doing or giving them facts just falls on deaf ears. Instead, here you are doing the thing that we know builds healthy brains and you're doing it all on your own. And look at what your baby or your child does when you do it. Look at how they light up. That, that's an example, I think, of how shifting the focus from, well, this will work pretty well on average to who do we need to reach who we can't ordinarily help has really been a game changer for us. So that's one. And then the other thing I'd say, again, very quickly, is that I think the evidence-based programs that exist have been too rigid. That is to say, this is the program that developed. You can't change it at all to the local context. And the best example, again, from the pandemic is we have many home visiting programs in the U.S. that are evidence-based that require a home visitor to visit a family on a regular basis in person. And when the pandemic happened and people couldn't actually go and visit families, we started hearing from the home visitors, couldn't we just contact them by phone or by text or by a video call? Because that's what people have been asking us for years. Do we always have to go in person? Because they don't, they act like they're not home, even though we know that they are home. When we when we knock on their door, they don't want us there. And we've always been told by the program developers, we can't do that because if you shift from in person to something else, we won't know if it works. If parents are telling us, this is what we want, we want you to come some of the time, but not all of the time. Can I just contact you by phone or by by text? We should be listening to that. And we should be then evaluating through these rapid cycles, whether those adaptations make a difference, especially for the people who won't engage in our studies and who won't engage in our programs. And if we don't do that, then we'll continue to reach this sort of level or asymptote of effectiveness, but we're never going to get a program that's all things for all people. So I think it's those kinds of things that really will make the biggest difference in transforming the field moving forward. Yeah. Yeah, it's such an interesting point, Phil. One of the things we talk quite a bit about with our emerging work with child and also work we're doing with other partners is not only to look at the, the families that stay in these programs and services, but what about the ones that didn't? And what's that story? Because people do vote with their feet, so to say, or don't open the door or don't answer the phone. And um, simple concept, concepts like acceptability and usability of services matter, they matter. And in fact, they predict the quality of the outcomes that you get. So I really, I really like that take. Um, Vivian, what, what comes to mind listening to those two and also in a Singapore context? A million thoughts. Um, <laughs> yeah, I this... would expect nothing less of you. <laughs> uh, not just to gather them. Um, yeah, I do agree that um, the communication between uh, practitioners, researchers, and policymakers are really very crucial. And having uh, coming from um, a clinical um, training myself and having to go into research speak and now uh, policy speak, uh, it, it sometimes it's hard to express uh, the things uh, or to communicate the findings in a way that is understandable by policymakers. And similarly, I think researchers and practitioners need to understand what policymakers need and want uh, in order to you know, get the outcomes that they're hoping for. So I think that's uh, something where, where there, if there are more um, opportunities for policymakers and practitioners and researchers to come together, that would really help. Um, I think other problems that we have is time and resources. Um, um, time because um, usually it's like they want it yesterday and we have not implemented it, but we have to show that it works already. Um, so it's that's always been a, a problem. Um, even as we start huge programs and we roll out to scale, we, there's not enough time to show that it works and then we are rolling it out. So I think that's, that's uh, an issue. Um, resources, I think sometimes the data collection involves uh, resourcing and um, data cannot magically appear. And it, it takes a lot of time to train people how to collect that data and to use that data and to make sense of it. And to, so I think that that is a, a difficulty that we have also in implementing. Um, what else? Uh, 
I, I do I think that uh, video coaching, as was mentioned just now, is really uh, good because I think in implementation science, we know it's just not um, training people on the skills, but it's the in vivo practice that's important. And I think we're probably not doing enough of that in home. And I, I think we are looking at these areas in early intervention now, some of the more um, using videos and using um, sort of um, live coaching uh, through through uh, a media. Um, so I think those are ways that we want to go. And I agree about the rigid Programming. I think many of the times uh, we do try and negotiate with purveyors of the programs, but no, we can't change anything. We got to deliver it as it is. And so we're quite excited to see what comes out of the different studies, uh, whether it's uh, um, maybe Chi Ming's study, I think Chi Ming's around today, or the Gusto study um, with Evelyn, that uh, if there are common elements that we can really implement. But again, it, it centers around... Um, the science behind it, the data collection, and whether we show that it works. So I think that's that's uh, an area that we are um, wanting to look at more. So I think, yeah, that's for me. Well, that's terrific. I mean, one of the studies that um, the team at Child will be involved in has this nifty name that I have to read out because uh, it's shocking with acronyms. But watch out, Vivian, and I know you're, you're going to help us get this up for the EASEL trial. Enhancing and screening early development to better children's lives. That is going to be taking the really innovative uh, assessment screening work that Evelyn Law is leading, uh, called the whole whole child whole child. I forget the name all the time. Whole child assessment. I'm going to call it. Thank whole you. Child. Thank you. She corrected. Um, yeah, <laughs> and uh, and pairing that with the use of active ingredients or common elements in early childhood. We're going to start. We're hoping to start in preschool settings in um, Singapore and we'll be moving that across to other um, innovative home-based home programs and all sorts of stuff, trying to kind of tackle exactly what the three of you are talking about. Yeah, one um, more thing I just wanted to make about uh, the difficulties is reach of our programs. And I think that's mm -hmm. where the common elements come in. We have wonderful programs like parenting or other programs. And when we when we do the program, eval, great effect size, everything works, but the reach is not there. So if we could introduce common elements, I think that would be one way to increase reach. Yeah, yeah. Let's, there's a really meaty question on the q and I'm going to read out um, and uh, ask each of you to comment on, which will be one of the challenges I think Child and other organisations like we all run have around the world. One of the key barriers in policymakers using good research to inform policy is the use of evidence to the contrary, sometimes from different contexts, to disregard good evidence. What can research agencies do to have a greater impact on policy when policymakers tend to, and please policymakers on the call, this is please do not be offended by what I'm about to say. I'm reading it verbatim. When policymakers may, I'm gonna add, that was my word, tend to pick and choose the evidence. So I'd like to hear from all three of you just briefly on your thoughts on that. It's interesting. Um, when we think about vaccination at the moment, um, I read something the other day that um, perhaps uh, anti-vaxxers don't need to demonstrate the, um, the harm, they just need to create doubt. And so I think our challenge is often um, clarifying the doubt and being really clear about what we know and what we don't know and what's promising. And I think sometimes um, we grab at evidence that we, um, we want to see, you know, we notice evidence that's, that's meaningful to us. So I think as uh, those of us who are in roles where we're helping to implement that science, we need to have really robust filters and we need to be able to help people uh, build their capacity to uh, appreciate good quality science and not so good quality science. And uh, you know, there are some really fundamental uh, things that we could be encouraging everybody to take on board as the, the, the first view of evidence to appreciate its quality. And I think going back to my comment about surrounding yourselves with the people to whom you're trying to um, disseminate your evidence, that helps to build those filters. So showing evidence uh, to families and ask them, what do you make of this? and getting their interpretation of it, showing it to community members, uh, our Child Development Atlas, for example. What do you make of what we see in your community? What things are of interest to you and how should we go about it? To create more discerning um, users of evidence, but also to create advocates. So uh, an example with our um, Bright Tomorrow's app, 
is those moments that we are nudging parents based on the age of their child and things that the parents have indicated that they're interested in. So today, my nudge, I'm pretending I have a three-year-old, my children are 20 and 25, but my three-year-old nudge today so that I can make sure our app's still working was reminding me that when my uh, children have um, a little bit of a meltdown emotionally, here are some things that I could try. Now, they're great ideas and it's bubble blowing to help children kind of get their breath again and to uh, find calm. But there's there's a button that's called Brainy Background. And that button is giving them a one sentence science explanation of why blowing bubbles is something really meaningful and is helpful. So it's embedding the advice in science. And we had parents and others, experts around the world who helped us write that Brainy Background which is really translating really complex science into really simple pieces where we've had a very high bar in what evidence is used to explain each of those moments. Brainy background, you say it's called. (laughs) Yes. What a terrific name. I mean, that might be an effective strategy itself. Just get that just gets my attention. I'm like, I need a brainy background. (laughs) That's terrific. Donna, Phil, do you have some thoughts? Uh, you know, the last bit of what Donna said is is along the lines of what I was thinking. We have worked extensively with this organization called the Frameworks Institute that's based in mm-hmm. Washington. And one of the things that I've learned through all of that work is how often scientists and researchers are terrible communicators. Uh, the, the things that we intend to communicate uh, oftentimes have the opposite effect, where instead of trying to encourage people to listen, the things we say actually stop people from listening almost from the beginning, because they, when we're talking about the magnitude of a problem to get people's attention, what's coming across is here's a hopeless situation that we can't do anything about. And a lot of the concepts that have really taken off that have been translated effectively, things like serve and return builds brain architecture and toxic stress, uh, uh, you know, is is this something that gets in the way of healthy development? Those are are exactly the kind of straightforward translations of complex scientific concepts that are they're not just simple buzzwords. They're they're very well grounded in the science, but they're designed to produce a kind of everybody gets on the same page. Everybody then can rally around a particular focus. And I've seen this happen in situations, for instance, in the child protection system in the U.S. It's a very adversarial relationship that often is is put in place. There's somebody who's worried about the well-being of the child. There is somebody from the legal system to represent the parent who's trying to get their child back. There's a judge who has to make all the decisions. And once we've come in with these concepts, like it's really about serve and return as the thing that we need to be thinking about and how much we can create that kind of stability for building brain architecture that we find that people align and get on the same page. I don't think we can necessarily do things when people are presenting counter evidence about things like vaccines to take that on directly. But I think what we can do is to become very clear and intentional communicators of the science in all of these areas and really have that drive the, the way in which the discussions go forward. I think it's it's really about having the effective ways of communicating more than worrying about whether other people can undo that. Although I think that mm. is always a challenge that we face. Mm. I'll put a, a triple plug in for the Frameworks Institute in, in the US. They've also done quite a bit of work with Donna and other colleagues we have here. And they're just very, very clever in the way they think about how to communicate or not to communicate. And I would agree, enormous amount of the research community aren't um, the most skilled communicators uh, at all. Um, Vivian, let us hear from you. Okay, um, firstly, I would like to say that I think in Singapore, the policy makers are very open to evidence. Um, they, they, are will, um, they understand the science behind it and they want to hear more. I think um, a good example would be, um, you know, we've shifted our children in our home care from um, majority in um, children's homes to half and half now. We're trying to move towards more foster care. Um, Chi Ming, uh, who is here, Dr. Chu, uh, his, done, his group has done like meta analysis and systematic reviews of all the literature. And, pres- and, and you know, that kind of gives us the backing to, to push for um, quite big changes because um, the whole idea of 
funding foster families instead of ch- children's homes. Um, it's a huge shift, but we've done some of those things. And I think even in the early childhood, the involvement of families, and routine-based interviews and all that comes from the research. And um, people are willing to actually follow um, what uh, the research shows. But I think it's, um, as mentioned, it's the communication. Sometimes we don't communicate it and sometimes we may not have enough local evidence. So I think we need to be confident enough about our evidence to be able to go to the policymakers and say, actually, this is what it's showing in Singapore. I mean, around the world is this, but in Singapore, this is what's coming out of the data. And I think we um, need more confidence and we need more data to do that. So I think some of the studies like um, Evelyn's, uh, Gusto and Chi Ming's Intrax, as they track cohorts of children uh, through uh, from birth, um, I think those will provide rich data for us to really go to policymakers and say, this is what our local data says. Um, this is relevant to our um, children in Singapore. And I think the last thing we have to bear in mind is that policy makers juggle so many competing uh, demands. Um, there's cost, practicality of in, in implementing something. A complete reversal of policy, it's co- going to be very difficult. It's, uh, it's like moving a huge ship, you know, it, 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 you can't like U-turn um, suddenly. And I think that that is the issues that we have. They have to also align some of the findings with other policies to make sure that everything's coherent or they'll be questioned. So there are a lot of things they have to think through and juggle. And um, so I think I think really it takes humility from all fronts. Uh, we, we think that as researchers, uh, we are right because we found like uh, the, I don't know what, found something, the treasure. Um, and, and policymakers probably think they're right because they understand the whole picture that researchers don't understand. And you don't know how difficult it is to change this. And practitioners say, you know, this is what works. Why are you having to research this? And I know what I'm doing. So I think um, everyone has to have the humility to kind of understand what, where the other person is coming from so that we can work together. That was perfect. Nicely bringing in all those areas that uh, that need to collaborate and cooperate. And again, if I could do a plug for child, that's exactly what the child is set up to do in Singapore to hopefully Vivian work with you and others to really kind of round that out. I'm going to give all three of you, I'm going to fill first a what's on top. We've got about four minutes left. I'd like to really hear what, what sparked your interest. Um, put a challenge down for child, please. We will try and live up to it. But just to, in summary, Phil, please, you go. Well, I just wanted to say, because policy has come up in a lot of the Q&A comments as well, that my experience is that uh, the opportunities for policy change are not linear. It's not that there's always an opportunity and things continue to develop in the same way over time. They're circumstantial and they occur in windows of time when there's greater openness to change. And I think it's been really important to me and to those that that are my colleagues to adopt that kind of an attitude. That is to say, I think there's never a time when, for instance, community and understanding how to impact things at a community level stops being important or stops being impactful. But I think there are times when policymakers are much more open to the information that we're delivering than others. And one of the things, for instance, that got me excited about the opening of the center is that it seems like those kinds of opportunities are really developing now in Singapore. It doesn't mean that there aren't challenges, but this is a moment where there's a lot of progress that could be made in policy. And when I see those things, then I want to move towards them because I think that's where the biggest change is going to be. When, for instance, in the U.S., we've had a pretty hostile government for a while uh, that's begun to change, but it wasn't a lot of point in putting a lot of effort into national policy for a while because there was nobody who was listening or could actually make a difference. So I look for the opportunities in terms of policy. And when I see the moment, I go for it. But I don't Mm -hmm. necessarily try to do it in times when I think it's really not going to make much of a difference. Then I focus on other things. Mm. Terrific. Well, I think with Child and the support from the Lean Foundation, it is our moment to go for it, as you say, Phil. Um, Donna? Uh, Just building on what Phil has said, I think that uh, if we take the uh, metaphor that we use often, serve and return, 
I think our challenge as researchers is we need to think about our serve and return and the uh, the processes. And now I heard um, Evelyn and others say, oh, no, it was Phil, I'm sorry, Phil made the comment that we need to respond to the child and so we need to watch what the child is doing and then we engage in serve and return. And I think that's a really important metaphor for us as translation scientists, picking up on Yvonne's comment with, that, with great humility We've found something here. We're watching to see what, how you interact with that and then we pick up on that and that we look at it as a dynamic interaction process. And I put the challenge out to child. Think of platforms as ways to do that. And we, as I said, have been incredibly fortunate with the Minjuru Foundation to create a series of platforms that deliver evidence in the moment. So with COVID, we've been able to use our Bright Tomorrows app to deliver really important information to parents within an hour of something that we've heard. And I think that that dynamic interaction, uh, the Child Development Atlas can deliver evidence about what's going on in a community in the moment. And we can circle a community and just deliver that evidence to that community, not blast it to everyone. So serve and return, we can do that as well. Thank you. Challenge accepted. Donna, challenge accepted. Vivian, you get the uh, the last say here, as it's as it should be. Um, I, I think it's really uh, a child could work very closely with all your stakeholders. Um, I think partnerships are very important. Uh, I'm so glad we're away from the dark ages where evidence was scoffed at. I mean, in Singapore, <laughs> we've really come a long way, and 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 I'm really glad for that. I think. Uh, one of the challenges uh, which, uh, I mean, you had mentioned before um, in, your, uh, in all your training on implementation science is that uh, the time it takes from the, the findings to get into to market, right, is, could be seven or eight years. And so I think I would, we really hope that we could do it faster. I mean, in Singapore, we kind of do things very fast. Um, so hopefully we have some systems in place where if the information is coming out of Gusto or Child and uh, um, Chi Ming's Intrax, we could really kind of get it quickly to market and, and using it uh, quickly. So I think that's what I would like to see, distilling that research quickly. All right. Our challenge is also accepted. And again, Vivian, we at Child is very much looking forward to partnering with MSF and other areas of the government in the, in the work that we're doing. I want to thank all three of you very sincerely. You are uh, I very much appreciate you all uh, agreeing to do this. Um, and on behalf of Child, we are very grateful. You've almost been on message perfectly. I am also looking forward to Child collaborating with all of you as we establish ourselves. So this won't be the last time we'll be um, having this conversation. But thank you, Donna, Phil and Vivian for your time. Thank you. Thank you, the panel panelists. Thank you. Um, I, I hope our audience have, uh, has had an enriching session today. I certainly have, um, of the many takeaways personally, the word humility beacons brightly. A uh, child will stay grounded. Uh, there are still many things we need to learn uh, to deliver our objectives, and child will need to learn from and work with many of the practitioners and organizations that are uh, in attendance today. So, so child will, will like to continue the dialogue with key stakeholders and we will welcome your feedback on the topics uh, raised at the webinar today. We'll continue our webinar series this year, uh, bringing the current findings that are backed by science uh, for discussion and to work collaboratively to translate uh, research into policy and interventions. So thank you for uh, celebrating the launch of CHAL with us today. Uh, please visit our website and subscribe our, to our web newsletter and follow our LinkedIn and Twitter pages for further uh, future updates. Have a great day ahead and we we'll hope to see you soon. Look in your eyes, I can see your life together Standing by you and I think I want to forever And after all it's coming i